Okay, class. So the next thing we'll talk about uh, is sudden cardiac death. So sudden cardiac death is something that happens every year. It gets a lot of media attention, uh, especially if it happens in professional sports. But unfortunately, it, it happens across every level of athletics. Um, and we'll get into some of the, the causes and things that can be done about it. But you know, two, two notable uh, cases, uh, Hank Ayers, um, who died at 23 in his conference uh, semifinals, moments after alley-ooping a signature tomahawk dunk. Um, and Reggie Lewis, who died uh, three you know, three years later at 28 in an open practice for the Celtics. And um, both of their uh, tragic deaths you know, led to some pretty, pretty significant changes in how we address both emergency response for athletes, having you know, defibrillators available you know, at every sporting event, um, training people on CPR and you know, having the appropriate staff and screening practices to prevent this stuff from ever happening. So... Um, or, or preventing it as best we can. So um, sudden cardiac death in the athlete uh, is the leading cause of non-traumatic mortality in athletes. The prevalence is overall pretty low, right? About 100 to 150 per year, or roughly about two to four per 100,000 per year. But it still happens every year. And again, it occurs across every level of sports. Um, we see a higher prevalence in Black and African American populations. Um, we'll get into maybe some reasons why. Um, now, there are some arguments that the it, it it isn't a greater risk in athletes across the general population. I'll I'll show some data from a French group, which kind of kind of refutes that. It's it's a little bit more nuanced than that, but. Um, again, overall kind of low, but one death, right, that could be preventable, I think is one too many. Sudden cardiac death can occur in any sport, right? Any sport, can, it can happen. In the United States, it's football and basketball that tends to be the highest, um, you know, the, the highest prevalence or highest incidence rates. We think this because these are our two most popular sports, as well as self-selection into sports that have stop and start versus continuous open sports like soccer or, tra or cross country, as well as when we look at the, the higher prevalence of certain conditions in, in Black and African uh, Americans, again, looking at participation rates in these two sports across the United States. So that, that may explain why we see a, a higher prevalence um, in, in those groups. And we also see a higher risk in, in males, about a nine to one ratio. So again, we, we break down you know, the top sports that you know, uh, males participate. Um, in youths, right, um, and the, the definition for this may vary, but uh, most people accept this as somewhere under 35 or under 30 at, at, for, for most. Um, and, you know, I think in the United States, it's under anyone under, I think, 18 still. But either way, uh, the leading causes are hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or HCM, coronary anomalies, and there's a few other causes, but those are probably the two biggest, and we'll, we'll cover what those are in a bit. Uh, in adults, sudden cardiac death is most often due to undiagnosed coronary artery disease um, and a plaque rupture. So we talked a little bit about this in our uh, uh, vascular disease lecture that, you know, what ends up creating an MI, which can lead to sudden cardiac death or, um, you know, cardiac arrest, you know, is a plaque rupturing. And typically in someone who doesn't realize they have this disease process going on and they go play a, a round of pickup basketball with their friends after not doing anything for years. And then that sudden increase in vigorous activity, right, creates a, you know, stress like a, along that plaque and it ruptures. And then they've got a, a big problem on their hands. Um, again, the most common mechanism of, of death is, again, a ventricular tachyarrhythmia, except for Marfan syndrome, which could be due to a aortic dissection rupture. So again, some people say that it's not a, a greater risk than across the population. However, if you look at um, the distribution of sudden cardiac death um, across all age groups, right? So if you, if you say all age groups, sure, right, sure. However, if you look at young competitive athletes, right, it is higher, right? This explains actually the, the, the general, you know, the, 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 the large proportion of the incidence rate in people who sustain sudden cardiac death um, under the age of 30, especially, especially the under age of 20. So again, maybe if we look across the population, yeah, you couldn't say sudden cardiac death is more common in, in an athlete. But if you look at, just again, as data from, from France, in people under 20, especially, 
uh, it's it's the majority of the cases of sudden cardiac death. So it, it really kind of depends. And then again, just remindering that there are some normal changes that occur in an athlete, but there are also some abnormal abnormalities here. We have these listed here, structural um, cardiac abnormalities. Again, that that's that non-reversible hypertrophy. Um, you know, and again, different cardiac abnormalities. Could be an infection leading to myocarditis, could be trauma, could be, um, you know, they could be have electrical abnormalities like Wolf Parkinson White syndrome, long QT syndrome, a bunch of different things. But again, there's these are different than these physiological adaptations that we see you know, from exercise training. These are structural defects in the heart that are not, not, not leading to improved exercise performance. Uh, the most common one that we see, again, um, is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, right? So strong genetic link to this condition, HCM. 55% of cases are you know, occur in someone with a familiar relative with this condition. It's more common in Black and African Americans. Um, and basically what we end up seeing is, you know, an increase in, in mass. So it's just an example of what the left ventricle looks like in this, in this case. It's just much thicker. And then we see a reduction, right, in the chamber side. It's just much thinner. So we think it's a combination of hypertrophy, impaired relaxation, as well as um, a left ventricular outflow obstruction. So when these individuals start to exercise, they, you know, their cardiac output starts to suffer. And again, your heart perfuses itself. You have impaired perfusion. We don't stabilize the membrane potentials as well. It can lead to arrhythmias, can lead to you know, other issues um, with these patients. Uh, they will often have an ejection murmur um, that changes with position. It's actually the opposite of what we hear with aortic stenosis. Um, so we hear a systolic murmur. So hear it during systole uh, after, after the uh, S1 heart sound. And um, it will amplify during standing and valsalva or things that raise thoracic pressure and will soften during sitting and squatting. Uh, they'll have a persistent splitting of the S2 heart sounds. Remember like a uh, transient S2 that splits, that discordance, that second heart sound, not abnormal. Um, well, abnormal, but benign in an athlete. Um, however, if it doesn't change with breath holds or, or deep breaths, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's abnormal very, and very concerning. They may also have an S4 gallop. Remember that stiff wall? This is an example of a very stiff hypertrophy uh, ventricle. And they may report syncope or dyspnea during exercise. Again, syncope, every, when it happens during exercise, your, your mind should go you know, almost automatically to some sort of cardiac cause, right? Um, and then a persistent hypertrophy of the left ventricle despite the training. Again, what you might often see around the NFL draft or NBA draft, you know, athletes, these guys go through all kinds of testing. They'll, they'll do echocardiograms to look at the size and the mass of the heart, the chamber sizes. And if they notice an abnormality, they'll put an athlete on three months of detraining and then uh, to see if it remodels and goes back, to, you know, reverts to a normal size. That would indicate it's a physiological adaptation, probably not as concerning if it doesn't, you know, the, that athlete may be flagged and, and may have to not participate in that sport. And again, that happens, unfortunately, um, often every year because things kind of get through the cracks. Um, and again, we see hyper, uh, death by hypertrophic cardiomyopathy more often in start and stop sports. We think this may be due to self-selection, right? Like, because, you know, if you have this really inefficient heart, you're probably not going to participate in something that really demands, like, you know, constant workload against the heart. There's no rest periods in rowing or long distance cycling and running. Um, but football or basketball, while it has its high intensity, like it's start and stop. You have a little bit of recovery. So we think athletes maybe self-select to sports that like allow them to kind of get by despite these uh, abnormalities. And then uh, there are some different things that we can see plotted if we do an uh, exercise test. So peak VO2 for an athlete really should be above about 50 mils per kg per minute. Um, especially in a well-trained athlete. Um, but in a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it'll be well below that on an averaging around 35, which is great for you know, the normal population. But for an athlete, even someone playing maybe like you know, a wide receiver in football like should, should have a pretty high VO2. Um, so that's something that we will, we will observe, a, a, a kind of surprisingly low VO2. And then oxygen pulse. And the oxygen pulse is a way for us to look at uh, the oxygen consumed per beat, 
Normally, it should be about 15 beats per uh, 15 mils per beat in men, about 10 per mils per beat in women, and we'll see a significant reduction in this um, in patients with uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Another common condition, again, is coronary anomalies. So these could be um, you know, abnormal placements of the coronary arteries. Um, you know, either you know they are running still epicardial, or running over the epicardium, just placed in the wrong reason, region. There are also some where you see the coronary arteries actually pierce the myocardium, which is very, 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 um, you know, not so great. Uh, the most common are to the left coronary artery. Um, and what ends up happening is you have some sort of impairment in blood flow because one of the coronaries gets compressed as the heart contracts uh, during, you know, systole. And as you exercise, there's more and more systole, right? Because you are cycling through the cardiac cycle more and more uh, frequently. Um, it's usually asymptomatic. They may have a little bit of angina. They may have some syncope during exercise. Um, again, anytime someone reports syncope during exercise, think cardiac cause, a youth athlete, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and then coronary anomalies should be a neck, uh, another one you should screen for. Uh, a, a common one or a, a particularly concerning one Myocardial bridges is where you, instead of having an epicardial coronary artery, which is again run across the top surface of the heart, these actually pierce the myocardium. So during systole, they get compressed, right? So everything downstream from that vessel, uh, you know, there's we lose we lose blood flow. The unfortunate thing, the resting ECGs for these patients are fairly normal, and they're typically asymptomatic. They may get a little bit of angina. Um, because again, that supply demand imbalance and the compression of that vessel as you know, heart rate increases, which increases demand and, and they're not able to match supply because that vessel is getting compressed. They may get nonspecific signs of ischemia, some conduction disturbances. These are only really uh, diagnosed with a angiogram. So uh, these patients will probably require some sort of surgical intervention, usually just a bypass uh, to, to skip the, the area where it is uh, blocked, um, or sorry, or penetrating the myocardium. Um, and again, picked up with a, with an angiogram. So again, anyone again, reporting angina, syncope, cardiac symptoms, especially in an athlete, um, someone without risk factors, think hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, then think you know coronary anomaly. And again, just, just, just remember the resting ECGs may be fairly normal. Stress testing may not show much, so an angiogram would still be kind of recommended. And just kind of what we see here, again, nor, you know, again during diastole, we see a normal vessel, hearts and relaxation, but when it contracts, this vessel gets compressed. So this is where the, the vessel is kind of piercing through the myocardium and then getting compressed by the, mus by the muscle. Marfan syndrome um, is a syndrome that results from the uh, overexpression, overproduction of transforming growth factor beta. So you've got long limbs, long kind of Kind of you know uh, body parts um, and you know an overgrowth of, of kind of everything. This affects the the the, um, the cardiac cardiovascular system as well. And in fact, cardiovascular disorders you know some people would say are as common as about nine in ten patients with Marfan syndrome have some sort of cardiac defect, either you know, mitral valve prolapse because the heart itself enlarges, aortic regurgitation because the leaflets maybe don't fall exactly. Um, on, on top of each other. They may have some arrhythmias due to the structural defects in the heart. Um, and then a big concern are aortic tears and ruptures um, because of, again, the, the soft tissue or connective tissue changes that occur in the vasculature as well in these patients. So the, the interventions for these patients, close monitoring, medications to manage arrhythmias, surgery like this we have here in, uh, in um, a sleeve procedure to repair a, um, a, a dissected, Oop, sorry about that, a dissected uh, 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 aorta, and activity modification. So the tough thing about this condition in particular is that uh, in certain sports, like in like basketball or volleyball, like where everyone's kind of tall, uh, it's maybe hard to kind of screen people because you're not maybe necessarily thinking about it because everyone looks the same. Um, there are certain like guidelines to pick someone up if they have Marfan syndrome or not. We're not going to cover that in this in this course because it's not a musculoskeletal course. But uh, just be aware of that. Be aware of this condition. Um, you know, and again, if you work in sports, it's something that you you should kind of have in the front front and center of your mind.
And then the other uh, we'll talk about is Komodo cordis. Um, it's a sudden blunt impact to the chest um, that causes death in the absence of cardiac damage. Basically what happens is you've got a, a high speed object hitting the chest during the uh, vulnerable period of the cardiac cycle. Um, so if it happens at the upstroke of the T wave, right, it can set the heart into a ventricular fibrillation, right? So um, the most common sports occurs in is baseball. Um, that's because circular objects um, that, are, that are hard, like a baseball, um, with a relatively small diameter, very specific uh, impact, um, have, the, have a higher risk of, of, of causing this. We see higher prevalences in younger athletes just because of the, the flexibility of their rib cage. If in an older athlete, rib cage is a little bit more ossified, a little bit more protective. Um, but again, like it, it is a big concern, especially in a youth athlete. Um, the concerning thing is shields don't particularly, aren't particularly effective at preventing it if it happens. Um, having defibrillators, really important. If the kid goes into VFib, the only way to get out of VFib is to defibrillate. Probably the biggest thing we can do, though, is to educate coaches and players. Again, it's very common in baseball, or most common in baseball, is to turn away from inside pitches. It, it's kind of wild. You still see this sometimes in, in youth sports that people are, for whatever reason, encouraging their, their batters to crowd the plate. Um, to get maybe hit by a pitch to get a, get on base. Like that's one, widely inappropriate uh, for a youth sport. And two, like it really sets them up for uh, for danger and, and a particularly very, very lethal uh, danger because uh, only 35% of cases are able to be resuscitated. So just be mindful of that. Um, in an older athlete, again, it, it's more likely some sort of undiagnosed or unmanaged uh, coronary artery disease and again, they you know they initiate vigorous exercise without ramping up activity gradually, um, and that transient you know or acute increase in vigorous vigorous activity with risk factors with maybe some plaques causes one of them to rupture, leading to an MI, leading to the cardiac arrest, and then potentially sudden cardiac death. Right. So again, uh, we're finding, however. Um, that, you know, again, this, this risk, there's this paradox almost with risk, especially in older um, athletes, and these are anyone over the age of 35, that the, the more frequently you participate, especially in light to moderate exercise, your, your risk goes down, right? So, you know, starting and building things up gradually decreases your risk uh, uh, profile. Um, and some data comes out of the AC, uh, ACSM that, again, the more frequently you participate in exercise, your risk of an acute MI related to, you know, vigorous exercise decreases. So the more habitually you exercise, your risk goes down. And even if you have risk factors, starting small and, and but staying frequent with your participation in exercise can significantly reduce your risk. Obviously, if you've got, you know, um, you know, multiple, multiple risk factors, it's still recommended to get consulted by, you know, an exercise professional or physician, you know, so a physical therapist or a family care doctor, just to manage them to make sure you know, your blood pressure and other things aren't completely out of sorts. Uh, but again, like, you know, for many years, recommendations were these patients with risk factors had to go through exercise screening prior to engagement in exercise. We learned quite quickly that that's probably creating a bottleneck and getting people, uh, preventing people from exercising, which is what we kind of want them to be doing and making the situation worse. So the, the, the shift now has been, well, even if you have risk factors, unless again, they're, you know, you're very high risk, you can probably start small, start low, start slow, and be gradual with your progression. So uh, we'll end here and then we'll get into some screening recommendations.